So if I can try to summarize what a nuclear fusion reactor is supposed to do. So you have, what, a couple of elements? What are usually the elements? Usually deuterium and tritium, which are the heavy forms of hydrogen. Hydrogen. You have those and you start heating it. And then as you start heating it, I forgot the temperature you said, but it About becomes plasma. Million, yeah. No, first first it becomes- Oh, first it becomes plasma. plasma. So it's a, it's a gas, and then yeah. it turns into a plasma at about 10,000 degrees. And then so you have a bunch of electrons and ions flying around, and then you keep heating the thing. Yeah. And uh, I guess as you heat the thing, the ions hit each other rarer and rarer. Yes. So, oh man, that's not fun. <laughs> so you have to keep he yes. heating it. Yes. Um, such that uh, you, you have to keep hitting it until the probability of them colliding becomes reasonably high. And so it and turns also on top of that, and sorry to interrupt, you have to prevent them from hitting the walls exactly. of the reactor yes, exactly. somehow. So you asked about the, the, the definitions of the requirements for fusion. So the most famous one, or some sense the most intuitive one, is the temperature. And the reason for that is that you, you can make many, many kinds of plasmas that have zero fusion going on in them. And the reason for this is that the average, so I say, man, you can make a plasma at around 10,000. In fact, if you come, by the way, you're welcome to come to our laboratory at the PSFC. I can show you a demonstration of a plasma mm -hmm. that you can see with your eyes and it's at about 10,000 degrees and you can put your hand up beside it and all this. And it's like, and nothing, there's zero fusion going on. So you have, uh, sorry, what was the temperature of the plasma? It's about 10,000 degrees. You can stick your hand in? Well, you can't stick your hand into it, but there's a glass tube. You can basically see this see with it your right bare there. eye. Yeah. And you can put your hand on the glass tube because it's... What's the it's, color? Is it purple? It's uh, it's purple, yeah. yeah. Blue and purple. It's blue yeah. and purple. Uh, it, is, it is kind of beautiful. Um, yeah, pl plasmas are actually quite uh, astonishing sometimes in their beauty. Actually, w uh, one of the most amazing forms of plasma is lightning, by the way, which is an instantaneous form of plasma that exists on Earth but immediately goes away because everything else around it is at room temperature. That's yeah, so there's different requirements in this. So making a plasma takes about this. But at 10,000 degrees, even at a million degrees, there's almost no probability uh, of the fusion reactions occurring. And this is because while the, the charged particles can hit into each other, if you go back to the very beginning of this, remember I said, oh, these charged particles have to get to within distances which are like this size of a nucleus because of the strong nuclear force. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, as the particles get closer, this the repulsion that comes from the charge, the Coulomb force, increases like the inverse distance squared. Oh, no. So as they get closer, it, they're pushing harder and harder apart. So then it, then it gets a little bit more exotic, which you, maybe you'll like though, that it turns out that you, people understood this in the, at the beginning of the, um, uh, of, of the age of after Rutherford discovered the nucleus. It's like, oh yeah, it's like, how are we going to, how is this going to work, right? Because how do you get anything within these distances? It's going to require extraordinary energy. And it does. And in fact, when you look at those energies, they're very, very high. Um, but it turns out quantum physics comes to the rescue because the particles aren't aren't actually just particles. They're also waves. This is the point of quantum, right? The, you can treat them both as waves and as, as particles. And it turns out if you get, if they get in close enough proximity to each other, then the particle pops through basically this energy barrier through a, an effect called quantum tunneling, which is really just the transposition of the fact that it's a wave so that it has a finite probability of this. It's, it's, this by the way, you talk about like, do, do you have a hard time like conceptualizing this? These are, this is one of them. It's quantum tunnel yeah, is one of them. Yeah, this is like throwing a ping pong ball like at a, a piece of paper and then every like, you know, 100 of them just like magically show up on the other side of the paper without seemingly breaking the paper. I mean, yeah. to use a physical <laughs> analogy. And yeah. that, that phenomenon is important, is, is uh, critical for the function of nuclear fusion. Yes, uh, from for, for ev all kinds of fusion so this this is the reason why stars can work as well too like the, the stars would have to be much much hotter actually to be able to in fact it's not clear that they would actually ignite in fact uh, with without this effect anyway so we get to that so this is why there's another requirement it's it's not so you must make a plasma but you also also must get it very hot in order for the reactions to have a significant probability to actually fuse mm -hmm. and it actually falls effectively almost to zero for lower temperatures as well too
So there, there's uh, some nice equation yes. that gets you to 50 million degrees, or like uh, yeah, the, the or that you said practically speaking 100 million. So it's a really simple equation. It's the ideal gas law, basically, almost. So it's the, in the end, you've got a certain number of particle of these fusion particles in the plasma state. They're in the plasma state. There's a certain number of particles. And if the confinement is perfect, if you put in a certain content of energy, then basically, eventually, they just they come up in a temperature, and they become they be, they go up they go up to high temperature. This turns out to be, by the way, extraordinarily small amounts of energy. And you go, what? It's like I'm getting something to like a hundred million degrees. That's going to take the biggest flame burner that I've ever seen. N no, and the reason for this is it goes back to the energy content of of this. So yeah, you have to there's you have to get it to high average energy, but there's very very few particles. This is low density. How it's do you low get density. it to be low density in a, in the reactor? Is this so? You, the way that you do this is primarily again. This is not exactly true in all kinds of, of fusion, but in the in, in the primary one that we work on, magnetic fusion, this is all happening in a hard vacuum. So it's like it's happening in outer space. So basically, you've gotten rid of all the other particles except for these specialized. So you add particles. them one at a time. Uh, then... No, actually, it's even easier than that. You you connect a gas valve, uh, and you basically leak gas into it in a controlled fashion. Yeah, yeah. Well, wow, this yeah. is beautiful. How do it's you a gas it? cylinder? <laughs> How do you get it from hitting the walls? Yeah. So now you've touched on the other necessary requirements. So it turns out it's not just temperature that's required. You must also confine it. So what does this mean, confine it? And there's two types of confinement, as you mentioned. You yeah. mentioned the magnetic one. Magnetic one, and there's one called inertial as well, too. But the general principle actually has nothing to do with, in particular, with what, you're, what with the technology is that you use to confine it. It's because... This goes back to the fact that the requirement in this is high temperature and thermal content. So it's like building a fire. Right? And what this means is that if you, when you release the energy into this or, or, or apply heat to this, if it just instantly leaks out, it can never get hot, right? So you're familiar with this is like if you've got something that you're, you're, you're trying to apply heat to, but you're just throwing the heat away very quickly. This is why we insulate homes, by the way, and things like this, right? It's like you don't want the heat that's coming into this room to just immediately leave because you'll just start consuming infinite amounts of heat to try to keep it hot. So in the end, this is one of the requirements, and it actually has a, a name. We call it the energy confinement time. So this means if you release a certain amount of energy into this fuel, um, kind of how long you sit there and you look at your watch, how long does it take for this energy to like leave the system? So you could imagine that in this room that, you know, these heaters are putting energy into the air in this room and you waited for a day, would all the heat have gone to outside if I open up the windows? Oh, there, that's energy confinement time. Okay, so it's the same concept as that. Um, so this is an important one. So all fusion must have confinement. Uh, there's another more esoteric reason for this, which is that, people often confuse temperature and energy. So what do I mean by that? So this is literally a temperature, which means that it is a system in which all the particles, every particle, has high kinetic energy and is actually in a fully relaxed state, namely that entropy has been maximized. I think it's a little bit more technical, but mm -hmm. this means that basically it is it is a thermal system. So it's like the air in this room, it's like the water, it's the water in this. These all have temperatures, which means that there's a distribution of those energies because the particles have collided so much that it's there. So we... This is distinguished from having high energy particles, like what we have in like particle accelerators, like CERN and so forth. Those are high kinetic energy, but it's not a temperature, so it actually doesn't count as confinement. So we go through all of those. You have temperature, um, and then the other requirement, not too surprising, is actually that there has to be enough density of the fuel. Enough, but not too much. Enough, but not too much, yes. And so in the end... Um, the way that it, uh, there's a fancy name for it, it's called the Lawson Criterion because it was it was it was formulated by scientists in the United Kingdom about 1956 or 1957, and this was essentially the realization of oh, this is what it's going to take, regardless of the confinement method. These are this is the basic what it is actually power balance. It just says oh, there's a certain amount of heat coming in, which is coming from the fusion reaction itself because the fusion reaction heats the, the fuel um, versus how fast you would lose it. And it, it basically summarize, it's summarized by those three parameters, which is fairly simple. So temperature, 
And then and the reason we say 100 million degrees is because almost all way in, in for, the, for this kind of fusion, deuterium tritium fusion, the minimum in the density and the confinement time product is at about 100 million. So you almost always design your device around that minimum. And then you try to get it contained well enough and you try to get enough density. So, you know, so that temperature thing sounds crazy, right? That's what we've actually achieved in the laboratory. Like our experiment here at MIT, when it ran its optimum configuration, it was at 100 million degrees. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't actually the, the product of the density and the confinement time wasn't sufficient that we were at a place that we were getting high net energy gain, but it was making fusion reactions. So this is the sequence that you go through. Make a plasma, then you get it hot enough. And when you get it hot enough, the fusion reactions start happening so rapidly that it's overcoming the, the rate at which it's leaking heat to the outside world. And at some point, it just becomes like a star, like a sun and our own, our, our own sun and a star it doesn't have anything plugged into it. It's just keeping itself hot through its own fusion reactions. In the end, that's really close to what a fusion power plant would look like. What does it visually look like? Does it, yeah. does it look like, like you said, like purple plasma? You know? Yeah, actually, it's, it's invisible to the eye because it's so hot that it's basically emitting light in frequencies that we can't detect. It's literally, it's vi invisible. <laughs> in fact, light goes through it, visible light goes through it so easy that if you were to look at it, what you would see in, in our own particular configuration, what we make is in the end is a donut shaped, um, it's a vacuum vessel to keep the, uh, the air out of it. And when you, in, when you turn on the plasma, it gets so hot that most of it just disappears in the visible spectrum. Mm -hmm. You can't see anything. And there's very, very cold plasma which is between 10 and 100,000 degrees, which is out in the very periphery of it, which is kind of, so the very cold plasma is allowed to interact with the, or kind of has to interact with something eventually at the boundary of the vacuum vessel. And this kind of makes a little halo around it and it glows this beautiful purple light basically. And these are, that's the, that's the, that's the, what we can sense in the human spectrum. Yeah. I, I uh, remember reading on a subreddit called Shower Thoughts uh, which people should check out. It's just fascinating philosophical ideas that strike you while you're in the shower. And one of them was, it's lucky that uh, fire, when it burns, communicates that it's hot using visible light. Yeah. Otherwise, hum humans would be screwed. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a deep, profound truth to that, but nevertheless, I did find it on Shower yes. Thoughts subreddit. Actually, I do have, the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> this goes off on a bit of, you're, you're right, this is actually, it's interesting because, uh, you know, as a scientist, you also think about evolutionary functions and how we got, like, why do we have the senses that we do? It's, yeah. It's an interesting question, right? Like, why can bees see in the ultraviolet and we can't? And then you go, well, it's natural selection. For some reason, this wasn't really particularly important to us, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't we see in the infrared and other things can? It's like, hmm. Because hmm. <laughs> yeah, the people it's, that it's, could. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a fascinating question, right? <laughs> Obviously, there's some, there's some advantage that you have there that isn't there, and even color distinguishing, right, of something safe to eat, not safe, whatever it would be. Uh, I'll actually go back to this because it's something that I, that I tell all, all of my, my students when I'm teaching um, ionizing radiation and radiological safety. Whatever you say, there's a cultural concern or that when people hear the word radiation, like, what does this mean? It, it literally just means light is what it means, right? But it's light in different parts of the spectrum, right? And so it turns out, besides the visible light that we can see here, we are immersed in almost the totality of the electromagnetic spectrum. There is visible light, there's infrared light, there is microwaves going around, as that's how our cell phone works. You can't, it, it's way past our detection capability. But also higher energy ones, which have to do with ultraviolet light, how you get a sunburn, um, and even x-rays and things like this at, at small levels are continually being, like from the concrete in, this, in the walls of this hotel, there's x-rays hitting our body continuously. Like I, can, I can bring out, a, I, we can go down to the lab at MIT and bring out a detector and show you. Every single room will have, will have these. By our body, you mean yeah. the 10 to the 28 atoms? Yeah, the, the 10 to the 28 atoms, and they're coming in and they're interacting with those things. And those, particularly the ones where the light is at higher average energy per, per light particle, those are the ones that can possibly have an effect on human health. So we we have it's interesting, humans and all animals have evolved on Earth where we're immersed in that all the time. Yeah. There's natural sources of radiation all the time. Yet we have zero ability to detect it. Like zero. Yeah, and our ability, cognitive ability to filter it all out and right. not 
It would probably overwhelm us actually if we could see all of it. But my main point is goes back to your thing about fire and and self protection. If if these ionize if ionizing radiation was such a critical aspect of the health of organisms on Earth, we would almost certainly have evolved methods to detect it, and we have none. <laughs> and anyway, uh, yes, the, the physical world that's all around is yes. just incredible. You're blowing my mind, uh, Doctor Dennis White.